my quines, I'd, I'd had to consider Scotland's three languages, Gaelic, Scots and English. And writing this book, I had to take this on board. Religion has influenced Gaelic and Scots and English. Mary Slessor, for example, was born in, um, in Aberdeen, but brought up in Dundee, another Dundonian, and lived most of her adult life in Nigeria. She was fluent in the Ethic language and spoke with a strong Scots accent, in fact, often in Scots, and um, as did another missionary, Jane Haining from Dumfrieshire, who was also a linguist. I was born and raised in the Scottish borders and grew up hearing Scots spoken in my home village at, uh, at school. Um, and uh, I love the language. I absolutely love Scots. Um, it's, it's range. It's, it's so tender and so visceral. Um, so there's about a third of the poems in the book are in Scots. Somebody said to me at one point when I was writing the book, how many poems are you going to have in Scots? You need to watch it. You know, I mean, people might not... This is Anna Buchan, uh, a zoologist and geologist born in Rose Harty, Aberdeenshire, 1897, and she died in Aberdeen in 1964. She was the curator of Marshall College Museum, Aberdeen, and Elgin Museum, writer of scientific articles. Um, she... Um, I read her obituary in the Press and Journal and um, I thought I'd invent a voice for this person um, for, to, to commemorate her. And it's, it's an invented voice of a granny and I'm imagining her granddaughter coming home from college. It's the 1960s and the granddaughter's feminism is awakening and um, the granddaughter's come in and uh, she's outraged by having read this obituary. So... Here we are, in the granny's voice, Anna Buchan's obituary. Yon woman was something else. I mean, the headline they printed in the paper yestreen when she'd pecked her last. Didn't he give us a clue? My granddaughter bringed in for the college. She's eye foo at all kind of bio-ordner facts that leave me a hint, particular new my mindin's tint. Apparently, says Susie, yon woman can't all about yerd. And what's bury it in it? Fossils like the rig bane are fit done to a bird. And all kind of gear, quays, ashets, bines for lang sign. She helped you to win of them between the railway line and Elgin Road. Mind where the old clay pits yins were worked? My brother's bits are still clattered with on. And there's nothing she didn't ken about lamps. Tillies, cruises, like I used to burn Ben. Yin, for reed clay, says Susie, for the Nile. Thousands of years sign, fair fan touche in style. In story museums, she'd scan and leet alphabet thing. Nay, mate her, whether talker or pauper or king. And she kenned all thing about the mountains or ice afore beasts were born. Could look at a slice o' yard and gi its name, date and place on our planet. She wasn't just a pretty face. <laughs> and here's Susie's pint. She's bailing o'er lass. This is the headline that come to pass abin her obituary. The bra woman, bless her, widow of an Elgin hairdresser. <laughs> <laughs> Now that's true. Every word of that poem is true. And that was the headline in her obituary. Um, so, um, thinking of this thing of... Uh, the, the other reason I read that is because, you know, this theme of um, defining women in terms of men all the time, you know, it's just, it drives you mad. And, um, I mean, one of them is Jenny Lee. And people go, oh, yes, the wife of... And I say, no, 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 we're not going there. She was the architect of the Open University and the Arts Council. She wasn't the wife of... So um, here's Jenny Lee. I, this poem is in the voice of the Open University, which she called her wee bastard. <laughs> Um, she didn't have children, so this was her child, she felt. And I thought it was just so ironic that Jenny Lee 
the architect of the Open University, which um, um, was initially named by Harold Wilson as the, of the, as the University of the Air, um, that Jenny Lee actually came from Loch Gelly in Fife, where the Loch Gelly Taws was made. You know, they, they whipped kids with those horrible leather things that were exported all over Scotland. And uh, to, to give you education, I telt you, you know, I telt you. Um, so beating education into you. So this is the Open University speaking. I am Jenny Lee's Open University. My wee bastard, she'd whisper, stroking the white paper that had my life laid out before the faithless members there's plenty want to see you dead in my waters, but I'll be mother and midwife and you will thrive. We were made for each other. Long before she knew it, daughter of Loch Gelly, coal and leather, families broken by the general strike, the town whose slit, tongued taws whipped bairns' palms in bleak schools, exporting the weapon to all the erts, inert strips of tanned hide, buffed to a shine and proudly stamped with their maker's name. Widowed by sixty and nothing to lose, she gives me her all. Only the best is good enough, she declares, my champion in Parliament's hallowed halls, a challenge to their gilded ranks. Hope and hokum, they howl, it'll never catch on. Dad wheels into her memory on his bike from Fife's mines, laden with laundry and food to keep his lass at her studies in the capital. Through me, she swears she'll honour him and Hardy's Jude, his unbearable fate. Lift the have-nots from obscurity by releasing knowledge like caged birds into the air. And look at me now, her only child, the wee bastard she dared to nurture. How I've grown. Um, the... Um, Reference to Thomas Hardy's novel, Jude the Obscure, one of my very, very favourite novels, um, I learned was, was, um, was also Jenny Lee's, um, one of her favourite uh, novels. She said that it was one of the most informative books for me when I was a young student, the struggle for self-education in circumstances of poverty. Where the voices in this poetry collection are, are Gallic, I've attempted to suggest the language with a hint of its syntax in English and have used some Gaelic words here and there. Although I'm married to a Gael and I'm familiar with Gaelic, I don't speak it with any fluency. I can manage sort of tea and coffee and shopping and weather Gaelic, but <laughs> not enough to write a poem. Um, Margaret Fay Shaw was an absolutely wonderful woman who... Um, who, who came from America, from Pennsylvania, and um, wrote an absolutely brilliant book. Well, she didn't, it wasn't written, it was one of those verbatim books. She, she collected the material from the uh, people of South Uist. The folk, the, the folk songs and folklore of South Uist is a fantastically significant book in its field. And this generation of people, in the, it was published in the 1950s, that um, she was collecting from. This was the generation who couldn't, were illiterate in, in the language because, of course, the la language was banned in schools. And uh, um, since Culloden's time, it, was, it had, it had um, uh, suffered desperately. Um, and she, um, she gave this back by learning the language, an American, coming with her camera, a young woman, um, she was inspired, and um, she, she's a very, very important um, uh, person. I haven't time to read all these poems um, and, um, and tell you about every woman in the book. Um, I would love to. Um, and um, in that poem, um, it's the, in the voice of Marie-Andre McRae, one of the two women that she lived with in, the, in a croft, two sisters, for five years and learnt the language. I felt, having read Margaret Fay's um, autobiography from the Alleghenies to the Hebrides, 
brilliant book, um, that she wouldn't really have spoken about herself, I think, um, in a poem, not in the way that I could find anyway. Um, she was a great character. She, she used to say, never say die, say do. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I, I gave the voice to Mariandra, who is a gale. Um, I was, um, she, of course, Mariandra, was deeply religious. There are lots of very religious women in this book. And I learned quite a lot about religion in the process because, of course, most people were religious. Um, and um, Helen McFarlane, the Chartist revolutionary, um, the first translator into English of the Communist Manifesto, admired hugely by Karl Marx. Um, she saw Christ as a manifesta manifestation of the democratic principle. And she wrote, I think one of the most astonishing experiences in the history of humanity was the appearance of the democratic idea in the person of a poor, despised Jewish proletarian, the Galilean carpenter's son who worked probably at his father's trade till he was 30 years of age and then began to teach his idea wrapped in parables and figures to other working men, chiefly fishermen, who listened to him while they mended their nets or cast them into the lake of Gennesaret. Do you understand now, says Helen, the meaning of the words democratic and social republic. They are the embodiment of that dying prayer of our first martyr, that all may be one, even as we are one. While Helen McFarlane's Christianity was um, a compassionate one, um, psychiatrist Isabel Emsley Hutton comments on the effects of fundamentalist Protestantism in her autobiography which I've mentioned memories of a doctor in war and peace and she says children in my day were brought up on the maximum of Christian terror and the minimum of Christian love it is indeed not too much to say that many Scottish children went through a mild conflict which might almost be termed religious melancholia before their first decade of life and that some carried their guilt and fears with them into adult life I think that's a very interesting comment. In selecting my quines, I wanted to represent a wide range of constituencies. As the mother of a daughter who has Down syndrome, I'm keenly aware of the marginalisation of people with disabilities. And through my researches, I discovered the activist Margaret Blackwood, another Dundonian. Her story is remarkable. I'll read you my poem for her takes quite a bit of digging sometimes to find if you're looking for a particular constituency which I was doing at times uh, but I didn't write about anybody that I felt I couldn't get a hook into for a, a poem because obviously the, it's a book of poetry um, and the poem it had to be something I could write a poem about this is Margaret Blackwood and her lobbying she was she was a campaigner for disabled people's rights her lobbying inspired by Megan de Boisson resulted in the 1970 Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act, leading to the introduction of benefits such as mobility and attendance allowances. Very, very important woman. All it takes. Learn to knit, they said, the stale air thick with the syrup of pity dripping about my wheelchair. I used to leap upstairs, two at a time, more dear than girl, till pain scorched my tendons and the years, like my limbs, wasted away. Or make lampshades, they'd say. I tried the watchmaker's trade and failed. Time trickled through my fingers, cogs and wheels faltering, miniature pinions, barrels and ratchets scattered to the floor in fragments of rage. Yet all it takes is a scrap of news, a lifeline buried in the small print. Someone out there, like me, but she's not going down. Megan de Boisson has a plan. Time becomes an oasis, no longer a wasteland. 
I'll not wait to die, as they predict, a bedridden heap in that vamped-up poor house at Logie.